Welcome to another episode of The Art of Mystery, where I recount a mysterious happening for your listening pleasure and draw a completely unrelated picture for your viewing pleasure. My goal for this series is to create a calming sensory experience for you so you can chill out and relax while I tell you the story. Today's episode is a famous Australian case, and that is the story of Tom and Chud, the Somerton Mare. On the first day of December 1948, the body of a man was found on Somerton Park Beach in Adelaide, South Australia. He was found at 6.30am, laying in the sand. His head was resting on the seawall and his legs were out in front of him, crossed. A cigarette was found in his right collar of his coat, and in his pockets were a rail ticket from Adelaide to Hanley Beach, a bus ticket from the city, which was not used, an American comb and a packet of juicy fruit gum. Also found was an Army Club cigarette packet, which contained seven cigarettes and a quarter full box of matches. The man had no identification on him. During the autopsy, it was determined that he was 40 to 45 years old, 5 foot 11 and of top physical condition. He had grey eyes and fair ginger hair, which was greying. His hands and nails showed no signs of manual labour and his feet were shaped to resemble that of a dancer or someone who wore boots with pointed toes. His calf muscles were pronounced, which is also a sign that he may have been a dancer. The man was dressed smart, and all tags on his clothing was cut off. He was not wearing a hat, which was unusual for the time, and was clean-shaven and had no wallet. It was revealed that he died at 2am on December 1st, with the pathologist, Dr. Dwyer, finding his heart to be of normal size and blood vessels in the brain were discernible with congestion. Also congested was the pharynx, the stomach, the second half of the duodenum, both kidneys, spleen, brain and liver. His liver had great excess of blood in its vessels and there was destruction in the centre of it. The esophagus was covered with mucus and had ulceration. In the stomach was blood mixed with food. The man's spleen was three times the normal size. He had acute gastritis hemorrhaging. According to the autopsy, the man's last meal was a pie, eaten three to four hours before he died. There was no foreign substances found in his body, and the pathologist concluded that the cause of death was most likely poison, but not by the pie. Dental records were not able to identify the man. On January 14, 1949, a brown suitcase was discovered by Adelaide Railway Station without a label. It had been checked into the cloakroom after 11am on November 30th, 1948. Within the suitcase was a dressing gown, size 7 red felt slippers, underwear, pyjamas, shaving items, trousers with sand in the cuffs, an electrician's screwdriver, a table knife cut down short and sharp, scissors with sharpened blades, a stenciling brush, and a square of zinc thought to have been used as a sheath for the knife and scissor. Also included in the case's contents was a thread of Barber brand orange wax thread, which was not available in Australia. This was the same thread used to repair the lining in the pocket of the trousers that the man was wearing, which showed that the case more than likely belonged to him. They also found a number of dry cleaning receipts in the case as well. Police found the name T. Keen on a tie, which was also in the suitcase, as well as Keen on a laundry bag, and Keen, without the E on the end, on a singlet. There were no spare socks, which was unusual, no correspondence, but there was pencils and unused stationery. A search concluded that there were no individuals by the name of T. Keen missing in any English-speaking country. During this time, wartime rationing was still in force, and the public would label all their items of clothing and remove previous labels from pieces that belonged to someone else. So, it is thought that the labels found were purposely overlooked by the person who removed them. A search of dry cleaning receipts also proved fruitless. In addition to the discovery of the suitcase... It was found that the man's shoes that he wore when he was found had been recently polished and did not appear to have been used in sand, suggesting that he may have been carried to the spot on the beach. 
A tiny paper was found with the words Tum and Shud in the pocket of the trouser pants. The phrase translates to ended or finished, and it belongs to the last page of the Rubiat of Umar Khayyam, a poetry book translated from Persian, which general theme is to live life to the fullest. An appeal by the police resulted in a 1941 edition of the book being brought forward by a member of the public who found it in an unlocked car. It is unknown when the book was found. The timing of such being significant, as the man is presumed, based on the suitcase, to have arrived in Adelaide the day before he was found on the beach. If the book was found one or two weeks before, it suggests that the man had visited previously or had been in Adelaide for a longer period. On the inside of the back cover of the book was indentations from handwriting, a telephone number, another number, and a piece of text that looked like an encrypted message. The book was missing the words on the last page and had a blank reverse, and testing revealed that the piece of paper was the page torn from the book. Cryptographers who studied the codes found indented on the book said that it would be impossible to find a satisfactory answer, and if it were an encrypted message, its brevity meant that it had insufficient symbols from which a clear meaning could be extracted and the text could be meaningless. The telephone number belonged to a nurse by the name of Jessica Thompson, whose maiden name is Harkness, and because of this will be referred to as Jessica. She lived in Glenelg, 400 metres north of the location where the Somerton man was found. When interviewed, Jessica said she did not know the man or why he would have her number or choose to visit her suburb. However, she reported that at some time in 1948, an unidentified man had attempted to visit her and asked a next-door neighbour about her. During her interview, it was noted that Jessica was being evasive and didn't seem like she wanted to talk about it. The police believed she knew the man's identity. She also requested that the police not keep a record of her identity, which would later hamper investigations as her real name may be a decryption key for the code. When she was shown the plaster cast of the face of the man, she claimed not to know him yet again, but her reaction was that of taken aback to the point where she was about to faint, immediately looked away and would not look at it again. She also stated that while working at the Royal North Shore Hospital during World War II, she owned a copy of the Rubiat in 1945 and had given it to an Army Lieutenant, Alf Boxall, who was serving at the water transport section of the Royal Australian Engineers. She said that after the war ended, she moved to Melbourne and married, and said she received a letter from Boxall and replied telling him she was now married. There is no evidence that Boxall had any contact with her after 1945. Police suspected that Boxall was the dead man. However, in July 1949, seven months after the Somerton man was found, he was found in Sydney and his copy of the Rubiat, a 1924 edition, was intact. He was unaware of any connection to the dead man. In March 2009, at the University of Adelaide, a team led by Professor Derek Abbott began to solve the case by cracking the code and proposing to exhume the body for DNA testing. They found the letter frequency was considerably different from letters written down randomly, and the frequency was to be further tested to determine if the alcohol level of the writer could alter random distribution. The format of the code also appeared to follow the train format of the Rubiat, supporting the theory that the code was a one-time pad encryption algorithm. But because the code is so short, they required the exact position, which was lost in the 60s. Maichi Hennenberg, a professor of anatomy at University of Adelaide, examined the images of the man's ears and found that he had an anomaly that 1-2% to of the Caucasian population possessed. It was also determined that he had a hyperdontia, which is a rare genetic disorder. Also, only 2% of the population have this. Abbott obtained a photograph of Jessica Thompson's eldest son, Robin, which showed that he too possessed both features, the ear anomaly and hyperdontia. The chance that this was a coincidence was 1 in 20 million. The media have suggested that Robin Thompson, who was 16 months old at 1948, and died in 2009, may have been a child of either Alf Boxall or the Southerton man, but passed off as Prosper Thompson, Jessica's husband's son. DNA testing would confirm if this theory is true.
and Abbott believed that exhumation and a DNA test would link the Somerton man to a list of surnames that, with existing clues from the man's identity, would be the last piece of the puzzle. Unfortunately, in 2011, the Attorney General John Roo refused permission for the exhumation process, stating, There needs to be public interest reasons that go well beyond public curiosity or broad scientific research. In November 2013, Kate Thompson gave an interview to 60 Minutes. She is the daughter of Jessica Thompson, and she shared that her mother had lied to the police and that Jessica knew the identity of the Somerton man, as was it known to a level higher than the police. It's Kate's theory that her mother and the Somerton man were both spies, noting that her mother taught English to migrants, had an interest in communism, and could speak Russian but did not tell Kate why or how she knew it. There are persistent theories that the man was a spy due to the historical context of his death. There had been at least two sites relatively close to Adelaide, which were an interest to spies. These were Radium Hill Uranium Mine and the Wamura Tier Range, which was an Anglo-Australian military research facility. His death coincided with the reorganisation of the Australian security agencies which culminated the following year and the founding of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation. This was then followed by a crackdown on Soviet espionage in Australia, which was revealed by intercepts of the Soviet communications under the Verona project. Robin Thompson, Jessica's firstborn, had a daughter with Roman Egan named Rachel. She also appeared on the interview and suggested that the Southerton man was Robin's father, and therefore her grandfather. As I stated before, what also supports this theory is that both Robin and the Southerton man share the rare genetic anomalies of the teeth and earrings. The Egan submitted a request to exhume the body for DNA test, with Derek Abbott in support of this, saying that the testing would be in line with the government's policy of identifying soldiers in war graves and would bring closure to their families. However, Kate Thompson opposed to this as it would be disrespectful to her brother. To this day, the case of the Somerton man remains unsolved. I hope you've enjoyed this brief retelling of this mystery, and if it leads you to do further research, let me know what you find in the comments below. And I hope you enjoyed this completely unrelated portrait. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I have more videos like this coming soon. This has been The Art of Mystery by Yolanda Lewis.